The group one ions that we will be testing for today include the lead two plus ion, the silver plus ion, and the mercury one ion. The bottles may be labeled either with simply the ion or with the compound uh, formula, for example, PBNO3. In each case, the uh, counter ion, the anion, is nitrate. So the PBNO32 is lead 2 nitrate, the AG plus is uh, the silver nitrate, and the HG2 plus 2 is mercury 1 nitrate. These are the reagents that we will be using in the silver group test. It is important to note both the chemical formula of what we are using and the concentration. As later in the lab, we may be using uh, reagents that have similar formulas or different concentrations. For example, you will notice that we are using both NH4OH, ammonium hydroxide, and HNO3, which is nitric acid. These have very different properties, including that one is an acid and one is a base. So it is very important that we not mix up these reagents. These will help us to give distinctive tests for the individual chemicals, resulting in a unique product that is easily discernible from the other products, so we can have clear knowledge of whether or not the unknown or specific ion we are looking for is present. Before we begin, it is important to keep your test tubes labeled. Because this is the first test tube I will be using, I have labeled it number one. We will add our first reagent, the six molar hydrochloric acid. As you can see, a white precipitate has formed. To ensure complete reaction, I will stir the test tube contents and then centrifuge uh, before moving on with the procedure. Also before proceeding, I have recorded my observations in my lab notebook. I have one column for the known test tube and another column for the unknown, which I will do later. I've labeled the test tube that the contents are in and what I've observed, both what the reaction was, forming precipitate, and what color white. Remember to make a distinction between something that is colored versus colorless and something that is clear versus cloudy. This precipitate is white, which makes it colorless, but it is not clear. A centrifuge will spin the test tubes around, forcing the solid material to the bottom of the test tube. Because it spins much like a washing machine, you must make sure to keep the uh, test tubes balanced with one another. Just as an unbalanced washing machine will begin to rock, so will the centrifuge, which could break either the centrifuge itself or the test tubes. The centrifuge holes each have a labeled number. You will want to remember which number you have placed your test tube in while you are doing the, the spinning of the centrifuge, because when the centrifuge stops, it won't necessarily be in the same place. I am putting my known centrifuge in number one and my known test tube in number one and I have another test tube with a similar volume of water that I'm placing directly across in number four. I will now secure the lid and turn the timer to two minutes. While I am centrifuging, rinsing, and centrifuging again my known test tube, I'm going to prepare a hot water bath. The hot water bath will hold the test tubes when they are done out of when they are done being used in the centrifuge. I want to choose a beaker that is large enough to hold the test tubes and a certain amount of water, but I don't want it so large that my test tubes will tip over on the inside, contaminating them with whatever tap water is in there. I've chosen a 250 milliliter beaker. It is roughly the height of a the test tubes that I've been using, and the test tube should be able to sit in there without falling over. After I have centrifuged and rinsed twice, I've added a little bit more deionized de water or distilled water to my test tube and stirred it up. I'm going to place this in the hot water bath for five minutes. I have also placed a test tube with just deionized water in here so that I can use it to rinse the filtrate when that time comes. 
Meanwhile, I need to set up my ring stand. I have the ring with a funnel in it and filter paper. I've wet the filter paper just enough so that it will stay in place. Underneath, I have a new test tube. This one labeled two, so I'm ready to go for my next steps. And it's sitting in a beaker, and that's just to hold it upright while I'm waiting, when I pull the uh, funnel out of the test tube so that it doesn't fall over. So once the uh, test tube has been sitting in the hot water bath for five minutes, I will pour the precipitate and the filtrate into the funnel and collect the precipitate in the funnel and the filtrate in the test tube below. Remember that your test tubes have been sitting in very hot water, so it's important to use test tube clamps rather than your fingers to pick up the test tubes. I'm going to pick up the test tube and I want to shake it just a little bit so that I can get the precipitate mixed up in the water and then I'm going to dump it quickly into the funnel. You'll notice that the precipitate stuck a little bit into the, into the test tube. So I'm going to need to use the water from my hot water in the other test tube in order to dislodge the precipitate and allow it to come out of the funnel. It is important to transfer the uh, precipitate and the um, supernatant fluid quickly Lead chloride is soluble when it is at high temperatures, um, but not so much at lower temperatures. So we don't want to give it time to cool down. We also want to make sure that we rinse through any of the lead ions that have been captured with the precipitate of the silver and the mercury. So again, we can fill our test tube with the hot water from the second test tube and pour it over the filtrate, over the precipitate. All of the ions in the filter paper right now should be silver chloride or mercury one chloride. The lead ions should be in the test tube number two, which has been removed. We can use one reagent to test both the mercury and the silver. So mercury will react with the ammonia in order to form both the mercury liquid, which is mercury zero, and mercury hydroxide mercury 2 hydroxide, which will be black. Either of those will appear as black on the paper, and we should see both of them. This is called disproportionation. Meanwhile, the silver ions will dissolve in the ammonia by forming a complex silver ammonium complex and will go into the test tube down below. Of course, we can't tell the difference between a clear colorless solution and one that is simply pure water or pure solvent. So we will have to do an additional test for the silver. Before I move on by adding the reagent, I want to make sure I have the correct material. This is ammonium hydroxide, which is the solution form of ammonia, and it is six molar, so I have the right reagent. This looks a lot like some of the other reagents we will use, but will react very differently. So it is important that I grab the right one. As you can see, there is an immediate reaction with the mercury forming a black solid. And there's some of the dark gray mercury liquid in there too, though you might not be able to distinguish it from the other mercury. I'm going to allow for the uh, filtrate to go through the solid and into the test tube below where we will test for the before the uh, silver ions. When I remove test tube three from below the filter, I noticed that it was slightly cloudy. It's possible that some of the lead ions remained with the white precipitate in the filter paper. This could have happened because while recording, I took some time and didn't filter it as hot as I would have really should have. In order to be sure that I don't contaminate my results, since I am going to be looking for a cloudy white precipitate in the next test, I'm going to centrifuge this and transfer to another test tube. After centrifuging, my solution now truly is clear. I've transferred the supernatant into a new test tube, which I've labeled 3A. 
so that I don't confuse it with the test tube that contained some of the uh, cloudy precipitate. Now I'm going to react it with nitric acid. Again, check both the concentration and the formula. Notice how similar this formula is to the ammonium hydroxide, containing the same elements. But these are very different compounds, as this one is a strong acid and ammonium hydroxide is a weak base. This will counteract the ammonium that is forming the complex ion with the silver, causing the silver to be able to react with the remaining chloride ions and to precipitate out. Notice that with each drop of the nitric acid, a cloudiness appears. This is a positive test for the silver ions. I'm now ready to return to test tube two. This is where my lead ions should be found. I'm going to react it with potassium chromate, checking to make sure that I have the right compound here. We are only using one concentration of this, which is why the concentration isn't labeled. We will add this dropwise to the lead. Notice that this is already yellow, so the appearance of yellow in our test tube shouldn't be surprising. What we're looking for is a precipitate, not just the yellow color. When lead reacts with ions such as chromate or iodide, it forms a very thick yellow color, almost looking like a blob of yellow paint. This color, along with the, the cloudiness that is present, shows us that the lead ions are present in test tube two. Lead and mercury are extremely toxic, so we want to make sure we properly dispose of our waste. The test tube containing lead, as well as the test tube containing anything we've used from uh, this group one analysis can be poured into the waste container labeled for these ions. Notice that there is still some residue in here. I should rinse this out with a small amount of water and dump it also into the same container. The filter paper will be disposed of in a separate solid waste container. You can see that I've been taking notes as I go, noting not just whether the test was positive or negative, but what exactly happened with each test. I've also indicated what test tube I'm using. Initially, I started with test tube one. Later on, I poured the filtrate into test tube two. Then I had test tube three and three A. For test tube two, I've indicated that my test was to add potassium chromate and the result was a thick yellow precipitate. So this way I know not only what happened, but what test tube was being used and also where that test tube came from in my procedure. I have marked out a couple of places for my unknown because we will not be doing the specific tests for lead or for mer mercury in the test for the unknown.